let's talk a little bit about EGFR mutation positive disease, realizing that the vast majority of these will be the exon 19 and 21. We know that we have three approved agents, uh, two first generation agents, erlotinib first and then gefitinib, and then a second generation agent of, of fatinib. So Jared, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to kind of walk us through you know, what the key issues are and that how do you decide, what do you use, and so on. So I think you decide with low passion. All three agents are FDA approved in the first line and have legitimate arguments for them. In my mind, to simplify these, I, I think of them as sort of taking on a spectrum um, of biologic equivalent dose, with gefitinib having the lowest biologic uh, equivalent uh, dose, um, uh, erlotinib being in the middle, and afatinib having the highest biologic uh, equivalent dose, as well as uh, irreversibility uh, and uh, HER2 uh, activity. Clinically, we have only one real study comparing these three agents. It compared uh, gefitinib and afatinib. At the median, the PFS was the same for the two agents at 11 months. The hazard ratio uh, did favor afatinib uh, at, uh, I think it was about 0.7. It was a late difference in the tail of the PFS curve. It was. That and some some was. see as significant and some people see as clinically underwhelming. I, I think that that's fair? I think that's fair, and the real question, of course, is quality of life and survival. Right, is right. what we really care about uh, for our patients in the broadest sense. The, yes, yeah, the, the the other point about that trial, though, even though PFS, it, it's a funny trial from a statistical design point of view. I haven't figured that out yet, but um, that's a whole not, another issue. The one thing I think is helpful from that trial is the overall response rates, which did significantly favor, and actually kind of very different in exon 21. I forget the numbers, but it's sort of like 70% for afatinib versus 45% in the exon 21, which, which is pretty different in that setting. And, you know, we, we tend to poo-poo response a lot, but, you know, if you shrink a tumor, patients feel better, and many of these patients are symptomatic. So response is important uh, in terms of the palliative aspect of uh, treatment, and, and it's important to patients, too, because they, you know, what's the first question they ask is, did my cancer shrink? Um, so. So, so, of course, quality of life, right, is a balance between two factors, the response, particularly in symptomatic patients, but also toxicity. Um, and so the more, uh, more potent agent did have more uh, toxicity, particularly in terms of diarrhea uh, and rash. When you try to compare erlotinib, um, it's very hard uh, to talk about PFS numbers because you're doing cross-trial comparisons to do that. From a toxicity standpoint, uh, I think they do make a spectrum with uh, afatinib having the most rash and diarrhea, erlotinib being in between, and gefitinib uh, having the least um, of those. The other question is, what will this mean for survival in an era where we have third-generation inhibitors? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's completely unknown. The Lux Lung 7 data we were just talking about, um, for uh, very happy reasons, is completely immature for survival on either arm. Uh, and so we have to wait for more information. Alex, your perspective on this yeah, first so line? A, uh, a couple of things strike me about the Lux Lung 7 trial. Obviously, the survival, while not mature, there wasn't a significant difference in the last data mm -hmm. cut that was presented. Um, so to me, my personal preference is to give a first-generation TKI because I don't think that, uh, in my mind, the marginal gains that we're seeing in response and progression-free survival justify the toxicity for a drug that's chronically dosed in some patients a year, two years, you know. Um, so um, one other point to bring up is that there was a lot of buzz around using afatinib for exon 19 deletions before this, because there was an analysis of the Lux Lung 3 and 6 trials where it seemed like the exon 19 deletion patients did better. And so now we're seeing, as you mentioned, the flip side where why are the responses in L858 are much more pronounced. Um, and the last point I want to make is if you have a motivated patient that's really looking to improve you know, their outcomes in the first line setting. There are other things you can do that we'll talk about shortly, like consider adding an anti-angiogenic, or if there's a clinical trial of a third generation TKI, might that improve response? 